Shalom, Israelites. First and foremost, I want to say all praises to Ahaya, Bahasham Yesha, Wa Racha Kodash. All right, and this one is just uh, a little something called How Legends Begin. All right, it's going into some of the legends of, uh, you know, the heathen, and specifically Esau, uh, and, and, and examining them and comparing them to actual biblical truth, showing that really the heathen just takes biblical truth and turns it into, a, uh, as the Bible would say, Jewish fable. All right, so let's continue and check this out. Biblical Unicorn versus Mythical Unicorn. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Unicorn, a mythological animal resembling a horse or a goat with a single horn on its forehead. The unicorn appeared in early Mesopotamian artworks and also was referred to in ancient myths of India and China. The earliest depiction in Greek literature of the single horn Greek monokiros, Latin unicornis, animal was by the historian Cetesius, 400 BCE, who related that the Indian wild ass was the size, oh, excuse me, was the size of a horse with a white body, purple head, and blue eyes, and on its forehead was a cubit long horn colored red at the pointed tip, black in the middle, and white at the base. Those who drank from its horn, excuse me, those who drank from its horn were thought to be protected from the stomach, from stomach trouble, epilepsy, and poison. Right, which all that all sounds like witchcraft and idolatry, uh, drinking from the 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 horn of this mythological uh, creature, but this uh, this unicorn uh, goes back to China and goes back to East uh, or what we call today East India, but it goes back to Indian uh, Elamite heritage as well before it came to the Greeks. Because remember, the Greeks always. They never they didn't have any gods. So when they came out the caves, when a white man came out the caves, he cleaved to other nations' gods and just gave them different names and kind of tweaked the story a little bit. All right. But the point is, when you see the unicorn or the so-called unicorn today, it's always depicted as this horse with the, uh, a corn on his head. You know, this horn, this long, you know, elongated horn and, um, you know, a mythical creature is always doing something mythical or just popping out of nowhere with all these colors and whatnot on some, you know, folly type stuff. But let's see what the Bible says about an actual unicorn. The book of Psalms, chapter 92, verse 9. For lo, thine enemies, O Ahia, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity, iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn... Shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn? I shall be anointed with fresh oil. All right. So King David, the king of Israel. Yeah. D David who slew Goliath. David believed in unicorns. All right. But let's see how to the extent that David believed in them. All right. It, 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 everybody wasn't bugged out how they are after the Greeks taking a. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans subduing the whole earth and pushing all this bug out through the earth, right? Uh, people back then had an understanding what of a what a unicorn actually was, and still even then, who today can anybody today say that they've actually set eyes on the actual depiction that they uh, depict of a unicorn, a horse with uh, the one horn? Nobody's ever seen that. Nobody's ever witnessed it. Nobody ever seen a real picture of it. All right. So let's see to the extent of um, what type of unicorn King David believed in, because it's here in the scriptures. All right. This is Strong seventy two fourteen Ra'am in ancient Hebrew, or in the fake Hebrew, it's Reem, a wild ox. From word origin, ra'am, a wild ox or wild oxen. All right, so oxen, cows, bullocks, you know, uh, uh, water buffaloes, so on and so forth, antelope, whatever, they have two horns. There's only one animal on the face of the earth that has one horn. And let's look at that animal. Rhinoceros unicornis, or the greater horned rhino, is the only land animal with a single horn. Much like the mythical unicorn, which the, 
these damn heathens, <laughs> you know, they're funny, man. Much like the mythical unicorn, but it really is the unicorn. You know, that unicorn, uni symbolizing one, corn meaning horn. All right. It says, making it a unique creature, also known as the Indian rhinoceros. It is found in marshy gra grasslands of Assam and the protected Terai region in Nepal. All right. So the unicorn that King David knew about. And a unicorn King David was talking about and referring to when the only logical unicorn, one horn beast, is the rhinoceros. It's the only creature that has one horn, one single horn, all right, and still existing today. So a person can play the game and say, oh, you know, there's there's different, right, what, there's other rhinos have, you know, the rhino has two horns. Well, that's a different species within the same family of a rhino, all right? The, the, the unicorn David was talking about, and that's referred to in the scriptures, is talking about the one horned rhino, the single horned rhino, all right? Um, during the time of the translation, there was the word rhinoceros didn't exist, all right? So they put oxen, for, and, and you look in the concordance, that's why it says wild oxen, because if you kind of put it together, you know, we put, put put these things together. Um, a rhinoceros is kind of like a wild oxen, um, in extent to extent. But the English translation we see there is unicorn, meaning one horned beast. All right, so let's move on. Samurais, Saul, and Seppuku. Seppuku is a Japanese ritualistic procedure slash act in which the participant or the uh, person that does it commits suicide. All right. They feel like they dishonor their self and they uh, do this all dramatized, uh, glamorized, uh, cinematic type suicide and um, kill themselves because they feel like they dishonored their family or their clan or, or, or whatever they feel like they hold honor to. Because remember the so-called Japanese, the Ammonites, there are people that try to promote outwardly that they're all honorable and such a warrior culture and whatnot, but they're just another bunch of rusty heathens, understand? So let's look at this seppuku or ritualistic suicide that they commit and see how it matches up and see where they got it from. First Samuel 31 and two. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Then Saul said unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest the uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not. For he was sore afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell upon it. All right. So uh, King Saul, the Benjamite king, the first king of Israel, he committed suicide and fell upon his own sword because he didn't want to be uh, dishonored in battle and be dishonored in battle and be taken by the, uh, the Philistines. Right. So the Ammonites, which today are the so-called Japanese, the Ammonites were in the land, all right? The Ammonites lived west of um, Israel. So the Ammonites have these have this history, and they know about all these records, even when they went to Japan, when they went east, all right? Excuse me, not west of Israel, but uh, east of Israel. When they went further east into, um, you know, Japan and, and, and China with the Moabites and whatnot. So they knew about this story, about Saul falling upon his own sword in battle, all right? Because he didn't want to uh, be dishonored. So let's prove it with some of their history. Oda Nobunaga. All right, Oda Nobunaga was a daimyo slash shogun over Japan, and he was been revered and regarded as Japan's greatest military leader. Let's read about him. Nobunaga was killed in the Honoji incident in 1582 when his retainer, Akichi Mitsu Mitsuhide, ambushed him in Kyoto and forced him to commit seppuku. Nobunaga was succeeded by uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who along with Tokugawa 
uh, forgive me with this Ammonite language, uh, Iayasu completed his war of unification shortly afterwards. All right, so Oda Nobunaga, he was, he was forced to commit suicide, just like Saul was forced to commit suicide. All right, because uh, Saul did have the most highest hand over him um, because he, uh, Samuel had also told him he was, him and his sons was going to die in battle anyways, but he was forced to commit suicide. All right, he didn't want to commit suicide, but he was forced to commit suicide pretty much. So Oda, Oda Nobunaga, which is, which is a, a military leader of the Ammonites, right, he commits the same act. These people are trying to relive and, and make legends um, off the Bible. Like the point always has to be remembered is that the Ammonites were in the land at that time. All right. The Ammonites, Moabites, even the Edomites. All right. So they have records and their records about these things and they just make them into legends. So let's move to the next one. Elgon and Buddha. The book of Judges, chapter three, verse 14. So the children of Israel served Elgon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto Ahiah, Ahiah raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Elgon, the king of Moab. But Elgon made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he, girt, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Elgon, king of Moab. And Elgon was a very fat man. Remember that, a very fat man. This is the king of the Moabites, the so-called Chinese. And when he had made an end to the offer, the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gigal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him, and Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from the Most High unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand, and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the half also went in after the blade. And the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. All right, so this 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 Moabite king, this so-called Chinese king, Elgon, is so fat that when Ehud assassinates him and stabs him through the belly, the dagger and the blade, the, the blade and the ha handle of the dagger, e Ehud can't even get it out. It the, the fat closed up on it, right? Verse 23, then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon them and locked them. So Ehud kills this Moabite king, Eglon, right? All right, the fat king, he's known for being pretty much the fattest person in scriptures. It's pointed out that he was so fat, right? And he's a Moabite king who are today the so-called Chinese people. Now, let's historically look at the Chinese people and see who they worship as a fat person. This is from the Center for Global Education, The Origins of Buddhism. The Buddha was born 563 BCE in a place called Lumbini near the Himalayan foothills and he began teaching around Benaraz at Sarnath. His E-Reign general was one of spiritual, intellectual, and social, social ferment. All right, so um, it's speaking about the so-called Buddha here. All right. And <clears throat> the point is that Buddha and Buddhism comes from Northeast India in specific the Himalayan foothills. It doesn't come from China. It didn't it originate in China. So why, where did these Chinese get Buddhism from? They're taking back their, their deity. All right. Because remember, uh, El Eglon was the fat king in the scriptures. The Moabite deity was, he was their king that got that, that was killed. And they would remember him through Buddha, because look, when you when e, when Buddha's in East India, he's all slim and so-called healthy looking or whatever. But when he gets back to China, he gets fat again. He gets morbidly obese. 
right? If you really look at that, when he's, when he's in China, he's all fat and laughing and just like the fat King Eglon because they got their deity back. This is what the heathen does. But when he's in India, he's all slim though, right? So this is just another remake of uh, what these heathens do. All right, so the, the Ammonites, they try to remake the Saul enactment and do the sepulchre. Their, their cousin slash brother, Moab, they want to uh, uh, try to relive and uh, uh, remember, bring into remembrance their, their fat king by through Buddha, right? Because Buddha's not even from China. Our Buddhism didn't even originate there. All right, so let's move to the next one. Titans, Giants, and Fallen Angels. The book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of the Most High saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Most High said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of the Most High came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. All right. So the fallen angels, the angels that were cast down with Satan, they went in unto the daughters of men in these times. Right. They saw that they were fair and they went in unto them and they bore children from them in those times. And they were called giants. All right. So let's look at the word giant and let's look at the whole Greek story of the Titans. All right. Because they take this whole biblical story of the fallen angels going into the daughters of men. Right. And uh, bearing, uh, basically giving birth to these earth born uh, children, which are so-called giants. Let's examine it. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica. On Titan, and it reads, Titan, in Greek mythology, any of the children of Uranus, which is symbolic of heaven, and Gaia, which is symbolic of the earth, and their descendants. Because remember, the fallen angels were casted out of heaven to the earth. According to Hesiod's Theogony, there were 12 original Titans. Just like the 12 tribes. And these 12 titans were brothers, just like the 12 tribes. So they literally, literally take the titan story, add 12 tribes, or add uh, 12 original titans to it, like the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, and make them brothers, just like the 12 sons of Jacob. And when you go back to the fallen angel thing, uh, Uranus which is heaven, Gaia, which is earth, the fallen angels were cast out of heaven to earth and bore uh, descendants, right? They take the whole story and just pretty much flip it into a Greek mythology, you know, a Greek tale. Also, anytime you see the Titans depicted, they're, they're super big, right? They're just, they're the this enormous, right? And, and, and they're uh, always depicted as some type of Greek deity, all right? So... Let's even examine the giant aspect. Giant, a legendary human-like being of great stature and strength, a living being of great size, a person of extraordinary powers. All right. So remember that powers doesn't have to go into the white man's teaching of powers and, uh, and sorcery and all of that, what, whatnot, but actually the Hebrew word, for powers is Allahayim. Powers is actually a Hebrew word. All right. Something unusually large or powerful. Now, none of these give the inclination to a 10,000 foot being, uh, 5,000 foot being, or even, even a 500 foot being. Right. This is just talking about something in innumer numerous in size compared to others. Now, let's look and see what the Bible says a giant is. Because the Bible has biblical definitions that's found right in the Bible if you read. The book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, 
The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. All right, and it say beings that are thousand foot or tall or five thousand foot tall. It said men that are, uh, are of great stature. Now let's see what they're called. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. All right. So it's talking about in comparison. Moses even it even says it here. And, and he, let me read it again. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. He's saying in comparison to other people's size, they were men of great stature, right? So if a person's uh, six foot tall and there's a person that's 10 foot tall or, or 11 foot tall, you know, like Goliath was 10 foot tall. It says this person is of great stature, enormous size compared to the others. So they call him a giant. Understand when you even look at the so-called hamedic people. All right. Um, they're some of the tallest people on the earth and they, and they still carry that, uh, you know, some of them would be like eight foot tall or something like that. So they still carry that. It's not, um, how can you say? It's a logical thing to think that because we see that today, but it's it's not logical to think of something that's a hundred foot tall, right? And that's what the Greeks make the Titan story. And that's what they make the whole teaching and understanding of what a giant is. And it's just pretty much a folly, uh, another legend um, that they came up with and tore out the page of the Bible. Heracles and Samson. This is from GreekGods.org regarding Hercules or Heracles. Heracles was the most popular Greek hero ever. He was known for his exceptional strength, which most people know about that, even surpassing many gods, as well as for his courage, his appetite for wine, food, and sexuality with both women and men. All right, so at the end of the day, Hercules or Heracles was a Batiman, all right, a Sodomite. So he has the exceptional strength and he has the so-called sexuality but both between women and men because even if you look at the cartoon the, the so-called disney cartoon of hercules um you always see women in the uh episode and he's being highly sensual with it if you, even if you look at the tv show um hercules back in the day he was always with dealing with the woman it was highly sensual Right. And whatnot. So remember the exceptional strength and the sexuality. All right. So when we go to that, now let's look at another attribute of Hercules. All right. Another trait. This is the initial 10 labors speaking about the 10 labors or 10 tasks that Heracles had to do. Eurystheus original 10 tasks for Heracles were the following ones. This is the first task. Y'all check this out to kill the Nemean lion. All right. So Heracles first task, right, was to kill the Nemean lion. All right. So he has exceptional strength. He's a supposed ladies man. And we, we find out he's a sodomite, too. I'm not even going to say there's no such thing as a, 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 a I'm not even going to know. He's a body man. All right. So and we find out that he killed a lion. All right, in his first task, the first thing he was supposed to be was supposed to do and he's going to be known for throughout, you know, is killing a lion. So strength, killing a lion and him being a ladies man. Right. So now let's see how that adds up with Samson in the scriptures and prove they just ripped the page out of the scriptures. The book of Judges, chapter 14, verse five, then went Samson down. And his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared against him. Remember Hercules or Heracles, his first task was to kill the lion, kill a lion. And the spirit of, of Ahia came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. All right. A young, a young goat. And he had nothing in his hand. All right. He didn't have no sword or weapon in his hand or nothing, but he told not his father or his mother, what he had done. All right. So Samson rips this lion into pieces. All right. That's exceptional strength. 
Uh, King David, yes, King David killed a lion, but he didn't rip it into pieces. All right, a man, it, it's one thing to kill a lion, but it's another to rip it into pieces, and that's what Samson did. But they take the Heracles story and make his first task to kill a lion. All right, now let's look at the over sexualized um, attributes of Hercules or Heracles and compare them to Samson. This is from a site called the Orlando Sentinel about Heracles and women. The ancient Greek hero Heracles slept with 50 women in one night and impregnated every single one of them. Theseus, heroic leader of Athens, abandoned his wife and stole another one, an Amazon to boot. All right. So we see he was uh, 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 he had the strength, the exceptional strength. We see he killed the lion and we see that he had a big woman problem. All right. Which you would call a whoremonger, pretty much straight up fornicator. Now, let's compare the strength and the lion killing and um, the 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 uh, uh, how could you say uh, ladies man thing. All right. Let's compare it to Samson because we already see that Samson killed the lion. We already see his strength from killing the lion. All right. Now, let's see how Samson was with women because we see how Heracles is. The book of Judges, chapter 16, verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither, and they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them. There goes that strength again. Bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up, excuse me, Salakia, carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. All right, so we see his strength displayed here again. All right, so he we see uh, it begins with him loving a harlot. All right, going into a harlot, you know, a woman he went by. Then he falls in love with Delilah. You understand? So it's that's all the heathen did, man. They took a page out of out of, out of the Bible, said we're gonna add the uh, the women thing, and uh, you know, make them make them have many women and uh, uh, you know, lustful and whatnot. Then we're gonna add, uh, not saying Samson was. But then we're going to add the strength, all right, the exceptional strength and make that be his main thing. And everybody's going to know about that. Right. And then all oh, at the top of it, we're going to put the killing a lion in there as well. All right. So the white man's a damn devil, man. And let it be known. Um, and let's just move on to the next one. Bigfoot and Cain. The book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thine hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. All right. So Cain was supposed to be a fugitive and a vagabond throughout the earth without a home, without the, a place to uh, rest his head, you understand. A land. So and he and also the the ground wouldn't yield forth any food unto him when he tried to till it. And so when you look at Cain, Cain goes the are the so called story the white man makes of Cain, he goes about through the earth as a vagabond and a fugitive. Like fugitive means you're running from uh, someone but you can't be caught. You understand? That's just like Cain. I mean, excuse me. It's just like um, Bigfoot. He's always running from somebody. They always get a, a, a supposed glimpse of him, which we all know this is fake. But they get a supposed glimpse of him, right? And that's it. But people are still pursuing him, making big stories about him, you know, and all of this and that. And he's a vagabond. He has no place to of, of rest in the earth, right? So the whole Bigfoot is just uh, a remake of the Cain story. Because he didn't have a place to rest his head, just like uh, the so-called Bigfoot goes about through the forest. Nobody even knows 
uh, 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 what his objective is, but he's just going about through the forest, right? And he's a fugitive. People are pursuing him, trying to get snapshots and all these stories and whatnot, and they can't get grasp him. You understand? And nobody said what he eats because this this they they ripped this page out of the Bible because it says that the the ground would not uh, yield unto him, right? So this is just another remake. All right, on to the next one. Leviathan and Godzilla. This Leviathan and Godzilla one is pretty much the biggest comparison uh, in, due to my research. All right. So let's examine these two and compare them. Godzilla etymology. All right. This is speaking about the origin of the word Godzilla. Godzilla is an angelized translation of the Japanese word Gojira. Gojira is actually the combination of two Japanese words. Gorilla, which means gorilla, and Kujira, which means whale. All right, so it, in essence, the origin of this so-called uh, creature uh, uh, story, right? His name was originally Gojira, all right, which mean, meant um, gorilla and whale. So where did it Godzilla come from? It's because when it got to America, they changed it to Godzilla because they're ultimate blasphemers. Right, they put the term God and Zilla in there. Anything we that's connected to Zilla, we know that's like a serpent, right? Or a reptile. So they're saying a reptile or a serpent of God, or God's serpent. All right. So the white men in 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 they 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 got together with the Ch Japanese and uh they came together and uh, propagated this big thing of Godzilla and really just ripped a uh, page out of the Bible. But we're just going to it right now and see. The book of Job, chapter 41, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? All right, so this is telling us from the get that this, this creature is um, a creature that is a sea creature or ocean creature, right? Canst thou put an hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make any supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? All right. So uh, it's saying, are you going to play with this? You can't play with this beast or do it like you uh, would uh, make anything else submit, submit to you. Right. Verse six. Shall thy companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Right. So that's once again, letting us know this is a uh, creature of the ocean, because back then, you know, the uh, a lot of banquets, fish would be uh, served and the merchants would be, you know, the, the ones at the uh, docks and whatnot that have the markets that sell the fish. Right. Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. All right. The hope of uh, fighting against this creature is in vain. It's meaningless. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who have prevented me that I, excuse me, that I should repay him? Whatsoever under the whole heaven is mine. Right. So this is even is a creature of the most high. Right. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely portion. Who can discover the face of his garment or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. All right. So when you look at the teeth of Godzilla, it's the same thing. All round about those, his teeth are uh, 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 terrible. You understand? Fierce. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. All right. That's why Godzilla uh, be under the water. You know, like when you see the movie scenes uh, start and whatnot, he comes from out the water. Right. And when they try to shoot at him or whatever, nothing can get through his scales. Right. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. All right. So nothing can get through his scales. It's like armor. by his kneesings. A, a light doeth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. 
All right, so his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Even when you look at the Godzilla movie, he has those fire eyes, right? They didn't have to make him like that, but he has the fire eyes. And sneezings means sneezings, right? So it's saying, by his sneezings, a light shineth. That's the flame going from his nose, right? Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. All right. You, when you see Godzilla, he's burning a whole city with the other or the town, whatever. When he gets mad or whatever, he's just burning the town with uh with fire out of his mouth and out of his nostrils go a smoke as out a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. It's the same thing with Godzilla. Right. They ripped this page out the Bible when uh, Godzilla is breathing. If you ever watch the movie, when he takes that deep breath, they even show like a. a, a how his lungs look on the inside, it gets all fiery like coals, and then he breathes fire, right? In his neck remain his strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. All right, so when people are dying and getting killed by him, it's joyful unto him. You understand? The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. All right, so it, when we look at Godzilla, once again, they're sitting up there shooting the tanks. The tank can't get through. They're flying, uh, they're shooting missiles off the, the fighter jets. It can't get through, right? This because it's his, his armor. You understand? Verse 24, his heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the neither millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reasons of breakings, they purify themselves. So when you look at that, when uh, uh, Godzilla comes to the town on the movie, he finally gets there and he's taken over. Or are they even find about find out about his presence? You see all of those so-called nations coming together that was battling against each other and this and that. And they try to fight their militaries against Godzilla. You understand? It's because when he raises up himself, the mighty are afraid. Verse 26. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the dart. Excuse me. The spear the dart, nor the habergeon. All right. So none of the weapons that uh, uh, are launched or shot at Godzilla, they can't hold up. Right. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. That's why, you know, he picks up the tanks and, and just throws them, whatever, you know, or he, he just breaks through the houses like it's nothing. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with with him into stubble. All right. So when they launch the missiles or whatever, you never see Godzilla turn around like, you know, like that's that's really doing anything to him. It's the sling stones are turned with him into stubble. All right. The little bullets or whatever they're going to launch at him. It just is nothing. It's like stubble unto him. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of the spear. All right. So when the uh, troops are there, right, trying to fight against Godzilla, they're really shaking. They're really fearful. Right. But they're still trying to launch their spear or their weapon. You understand? Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointy things upon the mire. He maketh the deep boil like a pot. He maketh the he maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. You understand? So when uh, even when you watch the Godzilla movie or anything, when you watch Godzilla, he's under the ocean and the, uh, the ocean's all bubbling and turning, you know, colors and red and whatnot, because you know, he's so hot down there. You understand? It says he maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be a hoary. All right. So the, the path that shines after him means everything behind him is destroyed and on fire. It's shining. So everything after him is on fire. You understand? Upon the earth, upon earth, there is not his like who is made without fear. All right. So beasts have fear. Men have fear. You understand? So, but this beast has no fear upon the earth. There is none his like who is made without fear. You understand? Verse 34. He beholdeth all things. He is king over all the children of pride. All right. So he'll be ruler over all the children of pride. All right. And we know it's these nations that um that conspire against the children of Israel. They're very prideful. So. Leviathan is a creature of the Most High. You understand here, here in the book of Job, it's not a fictitious uh, story or, 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 or creature. All right. So when we look at Godzilla, they just rip this page out and say, we're going to create this story of Godzilla. And, and we're going to pretty much just leave it how it is. You know, that's really what they did. They gave him the armor. They gave him the red eyes. They gave him the 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 
uh, fire, uh, you know, out of his mouth breathing, fire in his, uh, or coal in his lungs when he's breathing. You know, he's, he's throwing tanks, look, uh, you know, esteeming them as brass and not, and rotten wood, you know. So that's just another uh, legend, man. All right, so let's move to the next one. Superman and the Savior. Good old Clark Kent. At least that's what they told you his name was. The name given to Superman at birth by his biological parents, Jor-El and Lara, on the planet Krypton is called El. The name given to him, given to Superman by his adoptive parents, that would be his so-called earthly parents, Martha and Jonathan Kent, when he arrives in Smallville on Earth is Clark Kent, which continues to be the name of his alter ego. All right, so let's examine this. Superman is from the place that's from out this out of an earthly realm, right? A, a so-called different planet. You know, the planets don't exist, but he's from Krypton and his real name is called El, which if you look up in the Hebrew, call in Hebrew is all and El or all uh, all Allahia means power. All right. So call El in Hebrew in the modern Hebrew is all power. So they gave him the name All Power. Now, let's further look at why he has the name All Power and why he just so happens to have a Hebrew name on a cartoon and he's from a whole different planet that doesn't speak Hebrew. They should be speaking Kryptonian. You understand? All right. So another main reason is why they named him Call L is because Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster are fake Jews. Jewish sorcerers, all right, uh, people that say that they are Israelites, but not, which are the actually the synagogues of Satan in pursuance to the book of Revelation, chapter two, verse th uh, nine and chapter three, verse nine. So these creators of Superman gave him a Hebrew name because they want to mock and blaspheme the savior. Not to mention, all right, they give Superman the ability to fly. We know the Savior is coming back with the ability to fly. They give him superhuman, uh, uh, unmatched strength and speed, right? And at the top of it all, right, when you piss him off, when you get him mad, he gets the laser fire eyes. And in pursuance to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 14, we know the Savior is coming back with fire eyes, all right? It's like they take away the Savior being the uh, salvation of the people, which they think that it is the people, but it's the nation of Israel. And they give it to uh, Superman and make him the personal earth savior, right? And call him Superman when we know, when we know uh, uh, whom the world called Christ is son of man. You see how, how wicked the heathen is, man? And they title him or name him Call El, a Hebrew name meaning all power. Let's see what the Bible says about all power. The book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Yesha, whom some say Jesus, came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All right. So all power is given unto the Savior, the Son of Man, not Superman. You understand? That's blasphemy when the fake Jewish uh, devils got together and created that and gave him the name called El. All they wanted to do was mock the Savior because, lo and behold, we know these people don't even uh, believe in the Savior, you know. So remember that all power is given unto the Savior, not any Superman. All right, that's just another tale that's that's uh, um, that's been made up, another creation of the heathen to try, somehow try to fit in uh, with a biblical passage or biblical history. All right. So what's the whole point of the video? Here's one of them. The book of Job, chapter 30, verse 3. For want and famine, they were solitary. All right, so Job's talking about these people, a certain group of people. He's saying for, for want and famine, they were solitary. That means they were to themselves, isolated themselves. Fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste. All right, so they, they, he said they were fleeing and going into a wilderness that... In a former time, before that, it was desolate and waste, all right? Nobody went to that part of the wilderness because it was desolate and waste before that, in a former time. Verse 4, 
who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as a thief. All right. So what that is, is, you know, you, you picking up a piece of wood or something and, you know, get out of here, you eat them, you know, just, you know, about to throw the piece of wood at him because it's like he's you driving him away like a dog that's taking some food or something, you know, as a thief. You understand? It says to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys. So these people were driven away from the rest of mankind and they went into the cliffs in the valleys. Right. In the caves of the earth and in the rocks among the bushes, they braid. All right, braid, braid means to pound and cry. You understand? So they was crying and pounding in the bushes because nobody was dealing with them. You're right. And they had uh, there was a famine. Right. And they, they had a want and desire within inside of them. You understand? And under the nettles, they were gathered together. They were children of fools. Yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. All right. So we know this is talking about the Edomites. All right. So because they are the people that uh, dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in the cliffs of the rocks. So the point of bringing that out is to show Esau has no heritage. The white man has no heritage, no history. All right. His seed is spoiled. The heathen really has no history. They take everything from us. All right. And try to make stories and legends off them. How did you just come out the caves 2,500 years ago, 2,400 years ago? All right. And you wasn't even bathing into the moors of Europe taught you how to bathe. And now you're writing all these legends. They took them from the Bible. That's what they're doing. All right. Not saying all legends come from, but the, the ones that we're bringing out tonight definitely uh, have some comparison besides uh, the uh, Superman and the Savior, because there is no comparison unto the Savior. All right. Point number two. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. All right. We are that chosen generation, the so-called black, Hispanic and Native American man, woman and child. And, and so and there on. Every generation from there on, we are the chosen generation. Are we are the Israelites, man? The royal priesthood, the holy nation, and the peculiar people. So all of these, the white man really wants to write about you, but he can't because he wants to keep you in the slavery and he hates you. All right. So remember, when they write these legends, they really want to write them about you because you are legendary. All right. The Israel Israelites, we are legendary. All right. And like they say, th these are the things that legends are uh, written about. All right. That's not just a saying. They ripped it out. They just this is what they do. They ripping pages out the Bible and creating their own legends. All right. Kwam Yasharala, all praises to Ahaya Bahasham Yasha, Wa Racha Kwadash. And like I say, always in my videos, and like the prophet said before me, like the Holy Scripture said, death and destruction to Babylon.